The purpose of this video is to actually give you a fast track in learning some things that are not taught by your guitar teacher, are usually not talked about in videos online, and these are all things that you would think are common sense, but unless someone explained it to you, might not be so common. So let's start with the first tip. This is a common complaint with combo amp users, especially people who are new to the whole live gig and you know recording stuff, is that they have small combos, they put them directly on the ground, and then they complain that their amps aren't loud enough. The main issue is that a guitar signal, like the sound coming from a guitar amp, is very directional, as opposed to, let's say, your buddy there with the MPEG SVT. So if it's pointing at your feet, your ears aren't picking it up as well as if the amp was a little higher and aiming at your ears. So the trick is to either put it up on a chair, tilt it back, or find some kind of uh, racking system that works with your combo amp that you can prop it up on. Old Vox amplifiers had these you know, systems that you could put the amps on. I'm gonna try and put them up here on screen. So that's the idea. If you have a small combo amp, prop it up, point it at your ears, and you'll find that your amp is probably loud enough. It's just that if you aim it in the wrong direction, you're not gonna hear it as well. Now here's a struggle that people that have a one by 12 combo will relate to, and that is showing up to a gig and finding out that your one by 12 doesn't cut through. You don't hear it very well, you're struggling, especially if you play a 112 and you have a drummer that uses the toms or double kick a lot, a one by 12 is not gonna do it for you. So a simple option besides selling your amp is to actually use an extension cap. So if your amp permits, like I'm looking at my AC-15, which is a prime example, it has an external and an extension cabinet out. So that means if I want to, I can plug that amp into another cabinet and just use that cabinet, or I can have an extension cab that has another 12 inch speaker and connect to both of them. And the amp will play the speaker that's inside of it, but will also play the speaker that's in the other cab. So that way, if you need to disperse more sound than what your 112 can do. It's a fairly cheap upgrade compared to getting a new amp, and it's also a great way to be heard on stage. Now, the following advice I'm giving you is something that's been handed down from musicians to musicians over the years, and that is to not expect your bedroom settings on your amplifier to translate well live. And the reason for that is that when you set up your guitar amp at home, you're actually tuning the amplifier to the room that you're in for the volume you're playing at. But now you show up at a gig, and this might be your first, second, third gig, and you're using your amp with the same bedroom settings and you're just cranking up the volume and all of a sudden you can't hear yourself, it doesn't sound very good, and you're getting frustrated and you think the amp is the issue. And the amp might not be the issue. The issue is that you need to tune your amplifier to whatever room you're in. So if you find that by cranking the amplifier there's too much bass, don't be afraid to take down the bass. Write down your home settings so that way when you get back home you can set everything back up the way it was, but do take the time to tune your amplifier for the scenario that you're in. So if you're playing live, there's too much reverb, take some reverb off your amp, you don't need it. If there's too much low end, take some out of your signal. So just EQ and fit everything for scenarios. And every time you're gonna to go to a new place, you're gonna to have to do that. It takes mere seconds. And every time you do that, you get really great sound live. Now this next tip has to do with not just dialing the tone for the room you're in, but also dialing the tone for the band that you're playing with. A lot of time we're self-indulgent, meaning that we wanna have the best tone you've ever heard, we want it to be aggressive, we want it to be full, we want it to be all these things, but what we're not thinking about is the people we're playing with. So you have a bass player, that person is taking care of the low end, but the drummer also has a lot of low frequencies, also has a lot of high frequencies and mid frequencies. So the snare is competing with your guitar, but the snare is also competing with the singer, and the snare is competing with some of the sounds from the keyboard, and you have to think a bit about it this way. You're looking for a place to carve your tone so that people can hear you, but you're part of the mix. You're not just pitching out of the mix. You're not standing or poking out of it. A lot of people say, oh, that sound cuts through the mix. Well, you don't necessarily want to cut through it. You want to be in it. You want to be heard, but you don't want to be poking out too much where people are going, man, that guitar is loud or it's abrasive. 
whatever negative connotation that can be associated with guitar sounds. You want people to say, man, the band was awesome. And that's really the spirit of what you want with bandmates. You want your guitar to complement everything that's going on. So sometimes that's where that rolling down the volume might be helpful. You know, a singer's trying to scream at the top of their lungs and your guitar's just blaring. Turn that stuff down just a bit and the singer's gonna be happy. Maybe there's too much bass. Now the bassist can't really discern between your guitar and the bass. Take some of the bass down. That's really your objective is to really fit in with your band, with the sound, fit into the room you're in and don't be afraid to adjust those dials. So gain kind of fits in there. If you have too much gain, you're gonna lose clarity of the notes. You're gonna lose a lot of articulation. So sound takes a long time to master and that's really the tip I'm trying to get with this one is try to fit in with your band. Try to make sure that when you need to poke out, you know how to poke out. Maybe you're using a volume boost and then you roll back and you know how to come in and out for the different sections. So you learn the songs and you know how to apply your sound to each scenario. So this next tip has to do with how you practice guitar. Now I'm not a guitar teacher, so I'm not gonna be going to theory, but I'm going to give you a tip that is really gonna help you translate what you learn at home with the stage. So that is to practice standing up. It looks ridiculous when you think about it. You're like, what does it matter if I'm standing up or sitting down? I'm still practicing. But the real concept behind this is that when you're sitting down, you're in a very different position when you're playing. So when you get up, the guitar might be lower, that might change your arm position, it might change your dexterity. There's a lot of little minute details there that are super important. If you're gonna be practicing for a live show, stand up, practice it standing up. And sometimes you even see videos of people in the studio where they're standing up because the way that you play up versus down might change the energy, might change the dynamics, might even change how prolific you are on the instrument. So sitting down, you can sweep pick all day, but then you get up and all of a sudden you're, you play far less fancy. Practice standing up, it's gonna help you. Now this next tip is also free and it goes hand in hand with the thing I just talked about before. And that is to grab your phone, whatever it may be, and film yourself when you're practicing. So if you're practicing standing up, film yourself. That way you get to critique how you play and you also get to critique how you look. So if you play and you don't move very much, then you can start to incorporate more body movement. Or if you move too much and it's very distracting, then you can play it down a bit and just correct on the visual part of it. And then you can listen to how you play. Maybe you find that your solos are amazing, but maybe you're a bit sharp when you bend, or maybe it's a bit sloppy. There's gonna be things there that you're gonna be able to correct. You're gonna see and you're gonna hear what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. And I swear, if you start doing this more often, you're gonna get better as a player because every time you see things or hear things that you don't like, you're able to correct it. It's a great learning tool and it's free. You already have everything to film yourself. So I encourage you to try that and let me know what you think after you've been trying it for a while. So here's another tip that seems pretty obvious, but a lot of people still make this mistake. And that is to plug an acoustic electric guitar into an electric guitar amp. The reason why this is an issue is because a guitar amp, like an electric guitar amp, is tailor-made for a guitar pickup. So that is a very high impedance signal coming in. It doesn't sound full frequency with tons of bass and tons of highs. It's pretty limited bandwidth there for an electric guitar. But when you have an acoustic, it's a little bit more expansive in terms of the frequencies that it can produce. So now you plug it into a electric guitar amp and it doesn't sound very good. So if you show up to a gig and someone says, oh, we have an, uh, an amp there for your guitar and you see a Vox AC15 or maybe a Blues Junior and you plug your acoustic electric in there, it's not going to sound very good. So the solution for you if you play acoustic guitar and you have a pickup in your guitar would be to use a DI box. So that way you can send a very nice strong signal to the front of house and that way they can amplify your guitar into the PA system or to maybe rent or buy a proper acoustic guitar amp. Those are made with anti-feedback, they got reverb, you can plug your vocal mic directly into it. It's a much better sounding option and they're not too expensive compared to a tube amp. 
So if you show up to a gig, at the very least, if you have an acoustic, bring a quality DI box. There's uh, the one by Countryman, the Type 85. There's a, bu there's a bunch of them out there, just look for it. Even a cheap one will be better than plugging into a guitar amp. So that's my tip for you, acoustic jam don't plug into an electric amp. So this following tip is actually kind of funny when you think about it because a lot of people still make this mistake, although it seems kind of obvious. So you're auditioning a bass player, she doesn't have a bass amp. At the rehearsal space, you don't have a bass amp. And you tell them, plug into uh, Bobby's guitar amp over there, he won't mind. And the bass player plugs into the guitar amp, cranks it up, and blows the speaker. You're probably thinking, no duh, uh, anyone would have seen that coming. But a lot of people think that it's interchangeable. You can plug in a bass into a, a crank guitar amp and nothing will happen. And the truth is that a bass produces much lower bass frequencies than a guitar can. So the speaker is tailor-made for mid frequencies. If it's seeing too much low end, you risk damaging the speaker. So if you want to play bass through a guitar amp, you can probably get away with it at bedroom levels, but if you're rehearsing somewhere, a bass amplifier is needed because if you plug in a bass into a guitar amp, you will more than likely damage a speaker, if not damage the amplifier itself. So don't do that. The following advice is something that took me years before I clued in that this was an option, and this is using a looper switcher with your pedals. Sometimes we have pedals that are impedance sensitive, like a germanium fuzz face. Sometimes we have pedals that, for whatever reason, it just makes all the next pedal after sound really weird and wonky. So a great way to get rid of these issues and permitting you to keep playing the pedals that you love is to use a looper. So all the pedals plug into the looper and from there you can instantiate the pedal when you want to use it or take it completely out of the circuit so that way it doesn't affect the next pedals following the signal chain. It's an investment on your part. There are some very cheap ones and there are some much better ones. I'm using the Iguana Tail from One Control. This is not a sponsored video, it's just what I bought and I use. But there are like other companies like Gig Rig that make them, uh, the Quartermaster. So those are great options if you use a lot of pedals and you're finding that issue. It took me years before anyone turned me on to those, but now that I know about it, I can't live without it. So. Check it out and let me know what you think. This following tip is something that I drew inspiration from some of my favorite guitar players from the 1960s and 70s. Guys like Eddie Van Halen, Brian May, Tony Iommi, just to name a few. And that is the art of using the volume knob on your guitar. So these cats would use cranked up Marshalls or Laney's or Vox AC30s and they would use the volume control on their guitars to achieve different levels of gain. So full out on 10 would be like your lead tone or whatever if you hit a chorus and you needed something solid. But then if you turn down the volume to about seven or eight, that could be the rhythm tone and anything around five or six or lower would be the clean tone. It wasn't super clean, but oftentimes some of those amps were just one channel and that's how they did it. And I think that now we are kind of overcomplicating things with amps that have a clean, a crunch, and a lead channel, or we're using different pedals that we stack together. They're all viable ways of getting the same result. But sometimes when we don't have a whole lot of gear and you just have the one amp, one guitar, and maybe two, three pedals, don't forget that the volume pot on your guitar is your best friend. Learn to ride that volume to the specific sweet spots that you're looking for get the tones you want and you'll find that you don't have to tap dance so much when you're playing live. You just need to roll down that volume or roll it back up and you don't have to run to your pedal board to instantiate a pedal so that you can get your high gain. There's nothing wrong with that, I do it myself, but sometimes it's kind of fun to see how people used to do things and it makes a lot of sense. So volume pot, use it. Another mistake that a lot of people make both in the studio and live, especially when they start is to use way too much distortion. What that does is that a lot of times when we add too much distortion, you reduce the clarity of the notes that you are playing, you muddy up your signal, and then you're gonna have to turn up the volume because you get the impression that you can't hear yourself very well. Now tell yourself, if you can't hear yourself very well, the people who are sitting in the front row, they are hearing you super well. Now, it's just that you completely messed up your tone by adding way too much distortion. My advice to you would be to turn down the distortion 
and try it out and see if it's aggressive. And if it doesn't feel aggressive, just take it up a few notches from there and bring it up to the point where you start to feel like this is the right level then turn that down just a tiny bit. What that does is that it brings you to the place where you're comfortable, where it feels like you have the exact sort of distortion that you would like to hear and that inspires you to play. But by rolling it back just a little bit from there, you're gonna have a little bit less distortion and more clarity. And you're gonna get the same result you're looking for, except it's gonna be a bit better because people are gonna actually hear what you're playing as opposed to having a completely fuzzed out distortion signal that sounds like poo poo and you're on stage and everyone's like, what's this person playing? Nobody knows because we can't hear anything. And it's not the loudness that's the issue, it's actually the clarity of your notes. Use a little bit less distortion and you're gonna like your tone. So basically, the idea behind gain stacking is that you're gonna have pedals that do different things. So you might have a fuzz, a distortion, something like a light overdrive. You might have a volume boost, EQ and compression. Typically, you can mix and match those however you see fit. You need to experiment to really find out what you like. I'm gonna share with you how I like to do it and explain kind of the philosophy behind it. I like to have my high gain pedals first. So I go fuzz, distortion, then I go medium and light overdrive, then I'm gonna have an EQ, volume boost, and then my compressor. And the reason for how I put this together is that if I have my fuzz, but I don't like how it sounds on its own, I find it kind of fizzy, I might prefer it into a slightly overdriven pedal, so I might send the fuzz into the Timmy. Now the overdrive, I might not want to, not the overdrive, but the distortion, I might not want to send that into the Timmy or the blues driver. I might just want to shape some of the EQ from the pedal because the tone knobs on there, they're not really doing what I want to. So I'm gonna have an EQ later in the single chain and I might just do some slight EQ moves to improve the sound from the distortion pedal. Now I'm gonna have the EQ for that purpose, but what about the boost? A lot of people think about boosting first in line. What happens is that if you put the boost first, you're just sending more of your signal, a stronger signal to the, to the next pedal. But that pedal might not be louder, it just might distort more. So if the purpose is to increase the volume, you might prefer putting that boost pedal later on in the signal chain. And then last, I have the compressor. And the reason why I put the compressor last instead of first is that if you put it first, you're affecting the dynamic of what you're playing going into the pedals. So that's gonna be very different in terms of how the pedals react if it has like this big solid block of you playing like you're, you know, this big beast because that's what a compressor does. It attenuates the really strong signal and it lifts up the really weak ones and it makes your picking hand sound like it's really strong. But if that's not what you're looking to do with a compressor, I prefer gluing all the distortions together into something more cohesive. So I take the compressor and I put it last and I just put a little bit of it. It gives it a lift and it seems to take all the sounds that make it more glued together. It's really hard to explain the concept of gluing sound together, but sometimes if you stack two pe pedals together, one will sound like it's a little bit louder than the other, but then if you add a compressor, it just makes everything better. Give it a shot. I hope this is not too complicated, but that's my philosophy behind it. And when you play live, something like that can be very useful. Let me know what you think of it.